Very good to see all of you today. If you will, open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, I want us to begin with these thoughts in mind. That we are not the first generation to face the pressure to conform. We're not the first generation to be rejected and despised by society. We're not the first ones ever to be oppressed by the powerful. And we're not the first ones to be loved and supported by God. There's a long history of God loving His people and being with His people. When we look into Daniel chapter 3, we see an account where these elements come into play. We see an account of three young men who were under tremendous pressure to give in to idolatry. But they stood firm and they stood fast and God stood with them. If you remember in Daniel chapter 3 verse 16, as they have been pressured to worship an idol, it says that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king and said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. When we look at their example, as we study through this account today, we need to have the same resolve as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We need to be like them in having a faith and a commitment to God to serve and to honor Him. A determination to resist sin and the allurement of sin, the pressure that would be brought to bear against us. And we need to be ready and willing to give all in order to glorify and to honor God. So let's study beginning in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 1. Daniel 3 verse 1. It says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word and gathered together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces, or provinces to come to the dedication of the image of king which ne King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, and lyre in sympathy with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. One of the things that we see here that as the king has created this idol, has commanded people to worship, that you have this large gathering of people that come to worship that idol. This idol is probably a result of what the king dreamed in chapter 2. If you go back and read that, he had a dream, he had a dream of this great idol and how Daniel explained to him that this idol and the different parts of the idol represented different kingdoms, starting with his as the head of gold. And he probably created this as a result of that, thinking of honoring himself. And so he has made this idol, and he has commanded all the people to gather together to worship that idol. And it says that all the people obey. It tells us that these people from the different provinces these different ones of nations and languages. So many people from many different places had gathered together and it says that then when they heard the music, they bowed down and worshipped that idol. In other words, everyone was doing it. 
But you keep reading and you understand that not everyone was doing it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not doing it. But we have this pressure in our world and we have this idea that's sometimes used to excuse sin and saying, well, everybody is doing it. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, we know that John reveals to us what is obvious if we look in the world around us. When he says, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. When you look into the world around you, you understand that they are given over to wickedness, to sinfulness, to serving Satan instead of serving God. Now, the people in Nebuchadnezzar's day, they may have complied, they may have given in because of fear. Because the announcement was made, if you don't bow down to this idol, you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And so there was an element of fear being instilled in them that you need to do this. You need to, to obey. You need to go along with this. It may have been out of fashion. Well, look at all these high officials who are doing it. I need to do what all the high officials are doing. It. I need to fit in with everyone else. It may have been out of favor to gain favor of the king, to please him. Simply, I'm going to please the king. I don't really believe in this idol, uh, but I'm going to do it because I want his goodwill toward me. We understand that as we look into the world around us that there are people who give in to immorality and false religion for these same reasons. Sometimes it's out of fear. Out of fear of rejection. Out of fear of being thought ill by other people. Of being looked down upon by other people. Maybe it's because it's a fashionable behavior. And the people who are popular in society are doing that. Or the leaders in society so-called are doing these things. And so, well, if they're doing it, then I want to do it. Because I want to be like them. So they speak like them. They talk like them. They behave like them. It may be because they want to gain someone's favor. Because their friends are this way. And they want to be in the in crowd. Or they want to get favor from somebody who has authority over them to gain some type of advantage. So they go along with the crowd to fit in because everybody is doing it. Well, the Bible warns us about this attitude, about this idea of going along with the crowd all the way back in Exodus chapter 23. Exodus chapter 23 and verse 2, the people were told there, you shall not follow a crowd to do evil. The Bible is very clear from beginning to end that we are not to follow that crowd. We're not to do what everybody else does. Sometimes there's a saying that, well, you know, if a billion Chinamen are doing this, then it must be okay. It must be, must be something right about it. It doesn't matter how many people are doing it. It doesn't make it right. So we are not to follow a crowd to do evil, but rather, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 13 and 14, we are to follow that narrow way. In Matthew 6, remember, verse 11, or Matthew chapter 7, pardon me, Matthew 7, 13 and 14, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. And simply what he's telling us there, and what we see illustrated in the account of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is most of the world is going to lose their soul in hell. Most of the world is going along that broad path. Most of the world is following Satan and his will. And there are few, a precious few, who are willing to submit themselves to the commands of God, to honor Him and to glorify Him, that they may realize a home in heaven in the end. And we can't use the excuse, well, everybody is doing it. Well, everybody drinks. Well, everybody cusses. Well, everybody lies. We can't use that excuse. And the reality is not everyone is doing it. Not everyone is following in that way. We learn another lesson here as we go back to Daniel chapter 3 verses 8 through 12 that when we stand apart, 
people will turn against us. In Daniel chapter 3, in verse 8, Therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. So as all these people are falling in line and bowing down to the idol, given over to idolatry, these Chaldeans, it says, go to the king and report the Jews, report Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego specifically. That is a case where these individuals do not like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not like their behavior. It could be that they're envious and jealous of them because the king had raised them up to help run the province of Babylon. It could be out of spite and hatred or prejudice because they were Jews and they weren't Chaldeans. But this is an example of where society didn't like that these three young men did not conform to what everybody else was doing. And so they turn on them and they try to get them in trouble and they do really get them in trouble with King Nebuchadnezzar. They try to harm them. They try to hurt them. In Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, we have a record here of Saul of Tarsus. We've been introduced to him in Acts chapter 7 where he was consenting to the death of Stephen, that he guarded the coats, the clothes of those who were there stoning him to death. In chapter 8 it talks about that he made havoc of the church. In Acts chapter 9 verse 1 it says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him, or from, uh, asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So here's a case we see also in Acts chapter 9 of where there were men and women who were of the way. That means they were Christians. That means they were disciples of Christ. That means they had submitted their will to Christ. And they declared they believed Jesus as the Christ. And because they had accepted that, they had decided to be disciples of the Lord, that others in that society, in the Jewish society, turned against them. They would not allow others to make their own free will choice of what to do, what they believed what was right, to practice what they understand to be true, but they turned against them and attacked them to destroy them. Not going to them to try to persuade them that they believed wrong, that they needed to forsake this new religion, but they went to destroy their lives, to imprison them, to have them put to death. And you know, others will seek to hurt us because of our faith. They'll try to get us to be involved in sinful things and when we refuse to do that, when we decide that we're going to live righteously, they will turn against us. Some of the ways that I've seen this happen is people in the workplace, they're pressured yearly to give to the United Way. In certain workplaces, give to the United Way. Give to the United Way. We need to reach 100% participation. And it's a badge of honor that the manager or the leader in the company wears. Well, when you look into that, you understand what the United Way is about and how that money is handled. A lot of that money goes to immoral things. Abortion, homosexuality, things like that. And a Christian cannot participate in that. When you decide, you know what, I'm not going to do that, sometimes you get a black mark. Sometimes people turn against you 
in the workplace, maybe the manager, because they have that goal from their manager to reach 100% participation. Other ways I've seen this happen is when people have the office parties or the company get-togethers. There's drinking, there's cursing, there's all kinds of things that are going on that a Christian doesn't want to be around. They don't want their family to be around. They decide, I'm going to take a stand, I'm not going to do that. But you know, the company doesn't like that because you're not a team player. And so they will turn against you. They'll be angry with you. If you refuse as a young person to participate in a sinful project in school, maybe it's read filthy books. So that's fairly common nowadays, even down into the middle school ages. They'll assign them filthy books to read. Filled with immorality, filled with language. And young people who have convictions about that refuse to do that. Teachers don't like it. Teachers get upset sometimes about those things. So we understand that when we stand apart from society around us, we refuse to go along with what everybody else is doing with what society says is acceptable, even desirable, that that society will turn on us. We're seeing this now in our society in a very great degree. We don't agree with the transgender agenda. We don't agree that there are I don't know how many, I, I don't know if it's 30, 40 different gender identities. We say that doesn't even make sense. There's male and female. It's the way it's always been. Scientifically, you can see that. It's what the Word of God says. Created Adam, created Eve, created male, female. That's it. There are no others. We take a stand on that. We're attacked for that. Society is turning on those who will stand for the truth and not conform to what everybody so-called is doing. But not only that, not only will society turn on us, but government will pressure us as well. If we go back to Daniel chapter 3 verse 13. Daniel 3 verse 13 it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar in rage and fury gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the gold image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace, and who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? So the king is furious. And he threatens to kill Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Notice what he is doing here as he brings them in. He's asking this question. Now, it seems to me it's obvious Nebuchadnezzar has some measure of respect of appreciation and values these young men to some degree. Again, if you go back to Daniel chapter 2, you go back to Daniel chapter 1, you see how that Daniel and these young men made an impression on the king and how they had already served him well, how they had been elevated. So he recognizes there is value in these young men, but they're going to have to do what I want them to do. And he's telling them very plainly, look, I've heard this. He doesn't even give them a chance to answer to begin with. You know, is it true that you don't worship my God? You don't worship that image that I have set up? Well, just forget all that. When you hear the music, if you'll bow down, good. Just the next time, good. It'll be okay. It's almost like Nebuchadnezzar is saying, I'm going to let this one slide. If you'll just do it going forward. And he says, who is the God who will deliver you from my hands. You know, we may be threatened with severe consequences as they are being threatened here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Remember it says there, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It's not may suffer persecution, but you will suffer persecution if you're not ready and willing to be persecuted 
for the cause of Christ, you have no business being a Christian. You will be persecuted. You will suffer consequences. Because when you become a child of God, Satan is angry. And he's going to bring pressure to bear against you to give up the faith. To give up your loyalty, your pledge of allegiance, if you will, to Christ Jesus. So we may be threatened with severe consequences. It may be you're fired from your job because you don't participate, you don't go along with the sinful things. It may be that you're demoted or maybe you're just not promoted and they may threaten you with that. Well, you know, if you don't go along with this, you don't get involved in the drinking, you don't go drinking with the guys after work or with the girls, if you don't go drinking, well, then we just don't see a future for you here at this company. There's a lot of pressure in those types of environments to go along and pressure that they will bring consequences against you for not doing it. You know, young people sometimes are threatened with poor grades. Well, if you don't affirm evolution as a reality, well then you're not going to pass this class. I've heard of times when college professors, they'll have that first day of class and they'll essentially tell their students, look, if you believe in God, you believe in Jesus Christ and you're going to stick to that. You're not going to pass this class. Those types of things. You, you believe in creation. You don't believe in evolution. You reject evolution. Well, you're not going to pass this class. So they're threatened with consequences. Maybe it is that they don't start at sports because... For whatever reason, our society has decided that Sundays are great days to have sporting events. And we have all-day tournaments. And a young Christian decides, I'm going to worship God because that's what God wants me to do. I'm not going to be out there at the tournament. I'm not going to be out there on the ball field. And their coach says, well, okay, that's your choice, but you won't start. You won't play. So there are consequences to take a stand for what is right. Sometimes it's within our own family. We decide to obey the gospel. I know of many who have decided to obey the gospel and their families, we're done with you. Because their family is of a different religion. They're a member of a denomination and they see this individual who's decided to accept the truth and obey the gospel, they see them as betraying the family, as turning against the family. And so they will cut off ties with them and they'll harass them because they've obeyed the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we'll get pressure to conform. We will get pressure to do what the world around us is doing from people in authority, from people who have power over us, whether it's the government, whether it's companies, ones we work for, ones that we are customers of, think of the internet companies, if you will. There's great pressure. You've got society bringing this pressure to bear against us, and we have government or authorities pressuring us as well, conform or else. But we need to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and take a stand. When King Nebuchadnezzar back in Daniel chapter 3 verse 15 told them, you're going to be cast immediately into the burning fiery furnace. Who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Daniel 3 16 again. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. So they tell him at the beginning there, when it says we have no need to answer you, that's a little odd to us how they're responding. And what they're saying is, you already have our answer. We don't have to discuss it. The decision's already been made and we're not changing our mind. That's what they're telling the king. And they go on to say, you know, if that's the case, if you're going to throw us into the burning fiery furnace, 
And he had just asked the question, and who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Our God will deliver us from the fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. You see how bold these young men are? You don't intimidate us. You can threaten us. You can say whatever you want to say. And Nebuchadnezzar at this time is the most powerful man on earth. They say, we don't care what you say. We don't care how you threaten us. You say there's no God that can deliver us from your hand? Our God can. We trust in Him. We put our faith in Him. And we honor Him. And they were committed to God even if that meant their death because they say, but if not, we believe He can deliver us. And we believe He can deliver us from you. But if He doesn't, that doesn't change our mind. We're ready and willing to go into that fiery furnace. We're not ready and willing to compromise and be involved in idolatry. So we understand that we need to be steadfast in the faith just as they were in 1 Corinthians 16 1 Corinthians 16 verse 13 the Apostle Paul writes this watch, stand fast in the faith be brave, be strong you know it's important for us to make up our mind before the trial comes Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not decide what to do when they were standing before the king. As we noted, they had already made up their mind. We should not wait till we're under the pressure to deliberate, should I, shouldn't I? Which way do I go? We need to already be convicted and resolved before that time of trial comes and the decision is already made. We also see here that it's very important to have the right friends. You know, it was no doubt a comfort to Shadrach that Meshach and Abednego were there with him and the other two that they had the others with them. It's always better, is it not, to stand with someone than to stand all by yourself? We have to be careful in the friends that we choose, the people that we hang around. Because they're going to have an influence on us for good or for evil. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stuck together and went through this together. And no doubt it helped to give them strength to face this trial. But we understand, as the book later reveals to us, Daniel chapter 6, when Daniel was thrown in the lion's den, he had to stand alone. We have to be ready and willing to stand alone. Sometimes there's no avoiding that. But if we will choose our friends carefully, those friends will help us to get through those times of trial, get through that pressure that's being brought to bear upon us. So you have to take a stand. And I have to take a stand. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 3 now. Notice where the king punishes Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the government will punish those who resist it. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 19, the Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar's threats were not idle threats. I don't think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they stood strong, were saying, well, we're calling his bluff. He, he's really not going to do this. No, they knew he was serious. And we see in his actions here that he was over the top furious with them. It says the expression of his countenance toward them changed. And that, 
tells us in part that when he first told them, you know, is it true you don't serve my God? Well, I tell you what, if you just do it the next time, the music plays great, but if not, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace that he had some measure, though he was angry, he had some measure of control over himself, but when they are defiant, says he's full of fury, the expression on his face changed. You ever see that in someone? Just grit their teeth, get mad, probably turn red. That's how Nebuchadnezzar is here. He's exploded with anger. Heat up the furnace seven times more. And so he tells them to go grab them and throw them in. Binding them up, it talks about binding them. Their coats, their trousers, their turbans, their other garments. And part of what that's telling us is there's plenty of fuel when they go into that fire. So those garments are going to burn. That turban they have wrapped around their head, that's going to burn. And that these mighty men, these strong men who had grabbed them and took them up to throw them into the fire, the fire was so hot that it killed those men who got that close to be able to throw them in. So it's not like when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown in, somehow they hit a cool spot. <laughs> it's so hot that men who didn't even get into the fire died right there. And we're going to face fiery trials ourselves as committed disciples of Christ in 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. He said, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as some strange thing that happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory is revealed, you also may be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part He is blasphemed, but on your part He is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. When we commit our lives to Christ, He says, you're going to have fiery trials. But don't think it's strange. Don't think it's odd. You know, sometimes when people become a Christian and they face the trial, they're shocked that they're facing that trial. And sometimes I understand that they get this concept from the world around them that when you become a child of God, God all of a sudden just sort of sprinkles blessings all over your life and smooths things out in, in your way and you're not going to have any problems and you're going to have all the material things you could ever want. God's just going to you know, treat you like a grandchild and spoil you to death the rest of your life. That's not how God operates. When we become a child of God, that's when challenges begin in striving to serve Him faithfully and the devil is going to come after you to get you to compromise the faith. But he says we need to rejoice in those sufferings. So that means we're committed to God. And we have fellowship with God. And we have the blessings of God upon us, the spiritual blessings that are found in Christ Jesus. So don't suffer because you're a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, a busybody in other people's matters. In other words, don't live like the rest of the world. Because there's suffering in the world. And that's one of the things the devil lies to us about, getting us to think that, oh, the way the world's easier. It's, it's just so much better. And you're, you'll... You'll be happy and be joyous. You know, people who live in sin, they have misery, they have pain, they have heartache, and they try to cover that up maybe with another drink, maybe with more fornication, maybe with stealing other things. They try to cover it up. They try to cover that pain, that suffering up in their life. But the reality is, they're in pain and they're suffering. So he says, don't suffer in that way, but suffer as a Christian because there's no shame in suffering as a Christian. No need to be embarrassed about that. But you will glorify God in that. And when He returns in judgment, 
you will be rewarded with a home in heaven. You know, when we face fiery trials, it can be emotionally painful. When people around us are bringing pressure to bear upon us, they reject us. Sometimes it can be publicly humiliating. But if we're committed to Christ, we'll understand there's really no shame here. We'll be bold. We'll be brave. Even when the government may punish us, we may, we may be ridiculed, when people in positions of power and authority mock us and make fun of us because we have these old-fashioned values or we are Bible thumpers or whatever derogatory term they want to put on it, don't let that embarrass you or shame you. Then again, we want to notice that God stands with His people in Daniel chapter 3, verse 24. It says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So we recognize that when they're thrown into the fire, that God was with them in that fire. Now, some look at this and are convinced when it talks about the Son of God that Christ was there with him. More likely what it is is an angel of God. Very often in the Old Testament, the angel who's sent to talk to people is referred to as the Lord said when it's the angel speaking. But the point is, there is a spiritual being in there with them when they're going through this suffering. Or potential suffering, I should say, because they're in that fire, but they're not being consumed by that fire but they survive it. They get through this fiery trial, if you will. The Bible makes a promise to us that if we are committed to the Lord, He will be with us through all things. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, He says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for He Himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me? The Lord's not going to forsake us. If we're dedicated to Him, He will be with us at all times. Through that trial, through that suffering. No matter what men may do to us, He's not saying you're not going to suffer, you're not going to have pain, you're not going to have difficulties. He's saying I'll be there with you through that difficulty. Now, God may spare you completely as He did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There may be a consequence that you're facing and somehow it works out that never materializes. Even if somebody threatens it, even if somebody means it, it just doesn't come about. Maybe that is the case. But maybe it is simply that God's going to be with you as you endure it, as you go through that hardship. And in the end, He's going to reward. He's going to give us a home in heaven. Let's notice that our faith can have an influence with people around us. So go back to Daniel chapter 3, verse 26, beginning. <coughs> Daniel chapter 3, verse 26. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire and the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together. And they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. 
And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made in ash heap because there is no other god who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So as the king is looking in there and he sees them in the fire but up and walking around and everything is fine with them, he calls out to them to come out of that fire. So what he's just witnessed in them and what's happened to them has had a great impact. Their faith led them to action, taking a stand and being willing to accept the consequences. And because of that, and because of what had been witnessed by the king, it had a great impact on him, and it changed him. It completely turned him around. That now, he's saying not that they're going to be punished, but he actually promoted them, and not that he is denigrating their God. Remember before he said, well, who is the God who can deliver you from my hand? Now he's praising God. This is not a conversion. He is not a monotheist. He's just simply saying, well, the God that they worship is a great God and I've never seen anything like this and I'm amazed and anybody who speaks against Him, I'm going to punish them because He wanted the favor of all the gods. So this isn't Nebuchadnezzar all of a sudden realizing there's one true God. But he is recognizing the one true God's power. So their faith and their actions had a great impact. And our faith, our actions, can have a great impact on others. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter 2 verses 11 and 12, the apostle writes this, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. So be separate from the world, just like these three young men. Don't go along with the world. Don't go along with the fleshly lust which war against the soul, but have your conduct honorable. Be faithful, be holy, be righteous. Take that stand. And they may speak against you as evildoers, but you know what else? When they see your good works, there will be some, there will be some who are impacted by that. There will be some who devote their lives to Christ because they've seen what you've done they open up their heart to the gospel and they obey that gospel. We need to put our faith in action and stand firm in spite of the opposition and the suffering that comes with being a child of God. Stand out as a true believer in Christ. Not just one who pays lip service, but one who actually lives for the Lord. If you will, open up to number 840. 840. Hope you can see that image on the board there. Images of ancient ruins. That's Babylon that picture on the background. Babylon is part of the rebel pile of history. Nebuchadnezzar has been long dead. The empire collapsed about 2,500 years ago. The city itself lies in ruins in the third world nation of Iraq. In Daniel chapter 3, We've studied where the might and the power of that empire came up against the Almighty God. And Almighty God won. 
That empire is long gone in history. But God and His people and His kingdom endure to this day. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stand as heroes of faith. They stand as examples for us to follow, to be inspired by. Look how it is that they were loyal and true. They had faith and determination to serve God. They were committed to resisting sin. The pressure brought to bear on them to give in. And they were willing to give it all, to give their lives because of their faith, their commitment to God. Our resolve must match their resolve. Whatever we may need to face, we need to be willing to face that to honor and to glorify God even to the point of giving our lives. For those here who are children of God who have obeyed the Gospel, if you have compromised and turned back, there's a great warning in 2 Peter about those who had escaped sin and returned to it he says the latter end will be worse than the beginning because we've known the way of righteousness and we forsake it. If you're in that condition today, won't you repent of that? Won't you turn to the Lord, confess your sin to Him and seek His mercy and forgiveness? He will extend that. And then have that determination that you're going to take a stand for what is right. If you've never obeyed the gospel before, you recognize you need to prepare for the judgment. You need to prepare for that day when you will leave this world. And that judgment, understanding that that judgment is coming. You're going to have to stand before God and give an account for your life. And that right now you stand in sin. There's something you can do about that today. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, after Peter had told the crowd there that Jesus was Lord and Christ, and men in that crowd cried out and asked, What shall we do? He told them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you recognize your need to become a child of God today by confessing Christ, repenting of your sins, that means putting sin out of your life. You're changing your ways. And you'll be immersed to have your sins washed away. Then we encourage you, we invite you to do that. If you need to respond, please come forward now while we stand and sing.